Robert Louis Stevenson Pan's Pipes Narrated by Gary Williams The world in which we live has been variously said and sung by the most ingenious poets and philosophers, these reducing it to formula and chemical ingredients, those striking the lyre in high-sounding measures for the handiwork of God. What experience supplies is of a mingled tissue and the choosing mind has much to reject before it can get together the materials of a theory. Dew and thunder destroying Attila and the spring lambkins belong to an order of contrasts which no repetition can assimilate. There is an uncouth, outlandish strain throughout the web of the world, as from a vexatious planet in the house of life. Things are not congruous and wear strange disguises. The consummate flower is fostered out of dung, and after nourishing itself a while with heaven's delicate distillations, decays again into indistinguishable soil. And with Caesar's ashes, Hamlet tells us, the urchins make dirt pies and filthily besmear their countenance. Nay, the kindly shine of summer, when tracked home with a scientific spyglass, is found to issue from the most portentous nightmare of the universe, the great conflagrant sun, a world of hell's squibs, tumultuary, roaring aloud, inimical to life. The sun itself is enough to disgust a human being of the scene which he inhabits, and you would not fancy there was a green or habitable spot in a universe thus awfully lightened up. And yet it is by the blaze of such a conflagration to which the fire of Rome was but a spark that we do all our fiddling and hold domestic tea parties at the arbor door. The Greeks figured Pan, the god of nature, now terribly stamping his foot, so that armies were dispersed. Now, by the woodside on a summer noon, troweling on his pipe, until he charmed the hearts of upland ploughmen. And the Greeks, in so figuring, uttered the last word of human experience. To certain smoke-dried spirits, matter and motion and elastic ethers, and the hypothesis of this or that other spectacled professor tell a speaking story, but for youth and all ductile and congenial minds, Pan is not dead, but of all the classic hierarchy alone survives in triumph. Goat-footed, with a gleeful and angry look, the type of the shaggy world, and in every wood, if you go, with a spirit properly prepared, you shall hear the notes of his pipe. For it is a shaggy world, and yet studded with gardens, where the salt and tumbling sea receives clear rivers running from among the reeds and lilies, fruitful and austere, a rustic world, sunshiny, lewd and cruel. What is it the birds sing among the trees in pairing time? What means the sound of the rain falling far and wide upon the leafy forest? To what tune does the fisherman whistle as he hauls in his net at morning and the bright fish are heaped inside the boat? These are all airs upon Pan's pipe. He it was who gave them breath in the 
exaltation of his heart, and gleefully modulated their outflow with his lips and fingers. The coarse mirth of herdsmen shaking the dells with laughter and striking out high echoes from the rock, the tune of moving feet in the lampitch city or on the smooth ballroom floor, the hooves of the many horses beating the wide pastures in alarm, the song of the hurrying rivers, the colour of clear skies, and smiles, and the live touch of hands, and the voice of things, and their significant look, and the renovating influence they breathe forth. These are his joyful measures to which the whole earth treads in choral harmony. To the music the young lambs bound as to a tabor, and the London shop girl skips rudely in the dance, for it puts a spirit of gladness in all hearts, and to look on the happy side of nature is common in their hours to all created things. Some are vocal under a good influence, are pleasing whenever they are pleased, and hand on their happiness to others as a child who, looking upon lovely things, looks lovely. Some leap to the strains with unapt foot and make a halting figure in the universal dance, and some, like sour spectators at the play, receive the music into their hearts with an unmoved countenance and walk like strangers through the general rejoicing. But let him feign never so carefully there is not a man but has his pulses shaken when Pan trolls out a stave of ecstasy and sets the world a-singing. Alas, if that were all, but oftentimes the air is changed, and in the screech of the night wind, chasing navvies, subverting the tall ships and the rooted cedar of the hills, in the random deadly levin or the fury of headlong floods, we recognise the dread foundation of life and the anger in Pan's heart. Earth wages open war against her children, and under her softest touch hides treacherous claws. The cool waters invite us in to drown. The domestic hearth burns up in the hour of sleep and makes an end of all. Everything is good or bad, helpful or deadly not in itself, but by its circumstances. For a few bright days in England, the hurricane must break forth, and the North Sea pay a toll of populous ships. And when the universal music has led lovers into the paths of dalliance, confident of nature's sympathy, suddenly the air shifts into a minor, and death makes a clutch from its ambuscade below the bed of marriage. For death is given in a kiss. The dearest kindnesses are fatal, and into this life, where one thing preys upon another, the child too often makes its entrance from the mother's corpse. It is no wonder with so traitorous a scheme of things, if wise people who created for us the idea of Pan thought that of all fears the fear of him was the most terrible since it embraces all. And still we preserve the phrase, a panic terror, to reckon dangers to curiously, to hearken to intently for the threat that runs through all the winning music of the world, to hold back the hand from the rose because of the thorn and from life because of death, 
this it is to be afraid of Pan. Highly respectable citizens who flee life's pleasures and responsibilities and keep with upright hat upon the midway of custom, avoiding the right hand and the left, the ecstasies and the agonies. How surprised they would be if they could hear their attitude mythologically expressed and knew themselves as tooth-chattering ones who flee from nature because they fear the hand of nature's God. Shrilly sound panpipes, and behold, the banker instantly concealed in the bank parlour, for to distrust one's impulses is to be recreant to pan. There are moments when the mind refuses to be satisfied with evolution and demands a ruddier presentation of the sum of man's experience. Sometimes the mood is brought about by laughter and the humorous side of life, and when abstracting ourselves from earth, we imagine people plodding on foot or seated in ships and speedy trains with the planet all the while whirling in the opposite direction, so that for all their hurry they travel back foremost through the universe of space. Sometimes it comes by the spirit of delight, and sometimes by the spirit of terror. At least there will always be hours when we refuse to be put off by the faint of explanation nicknamed science, and demand instead some palpitating image of our estate that shall represent the troubled and uncertain element in which we dwell, and satisfy reason by the means of art. Science writes of the world as if with the cold finger of a starfish. It is all true. But what is it when compared to the reality of which it discourses? Where hearts beat high in April, and death strikes, and hills totter in the earthquake, and there is a glamour over all the objects of sight, and the thrill in all noises for the ear, and romance herself has made her dwelling among men. So we come back to the old myth and hear the goat-footed piper making the music which is itself the charm and terror of things. And when a glen invites our visiting footsteps, fancy that Pan leads us thither with a gracious tremolo, or when our hearts quail, at the thunder of the cataract, tell ourselves that he has stamped his hoof in the nigh thicket.